pirates are going to be very authentic and have the fear and the loathing that you want them to have, and yet you're going to have a lot of humor with that. So that's why we have gore. When you make a movie like this, you quite often get up in the morning and go to set, and you feel like you're nine years old. Back, you know, in the movies you, that sort of influenced you when you were a child. God, let's try that again. Not only are the sets vast and huge and everything, but when you fly out to the Caribbean and you see a whole bay built up to be Port Royal with, you know, four or five huge tall ships in the harbor and hundreds of extras running around in, in, in uniform and, you know, the undertaking was so big. When I first heard of the film, I was given a call and I thought, Pirates of the Caribbean, are we going real? Are we going like Disneyland? So we uh, got the script and then we realized that it, it was going to be as a real a film as possible. When I walked onto stage two and saw the cave for the first time, the initial thing was like, oh, <laughs> that's very big. But what immediately took over was how beautiful it was and how, how, how well designed. As soon as you, you start doing research, you find out all of this wonderful stuff about what really happened. You immediately say, Caribbean pirates. And then you start pulling up everything, and you see, you know, photos, and then you go from there, and then you say, well, if he looks like this, then he has to come from this. And his boat would look like this. Now, this thing will jump back at least three feet. My function is to integrate historical reality with movie reality. My area of expertise is primarily uh, 1500 to 1900 general uh, historical information regarding uh, dress and custom and then a specific uh, expertise in, in military uh, history as well. It goes on the thumb of the, uh, of the gun captain, so that's the prop. Uh, I spoke to props early on about all the uh, appropriate types of swords and weapons. We have two types of swords principally, the short swords that you'd refer to as cutlasses uh, and what are called small swords, the long straight bladed civilian and uh, officers type swords. We have pistols, we have uh, blunderbusses which are like short uh, firearms, uh, carbines and long muskets. Pirate's best friend. All the period pieces we, we pretty much built from scratch. Built over 72 cannons, four different sizes. All the carriages for the cannons, all the metal work for them. Last time you left me a pistol with one shot. With the powers you're right, where is Jack's pistol? Jack's pistol was very important. Gore wanted a real pistol from the 1700s. So we started doing some shopping. He wanted the silver and lay to be the real stuff from the mid-18th century. The guns that we bought from a dealer in Connecticut, uh, they were made in London by a fellow named Perry in 1760. Okay, let's go, shooters, you ready? And then uh, we uh, did a rental with the other pistols through a company in Los Angeles, their reproductions. The biggest set and one of the bigger challenges would be the treasure cave. And just trying to get the sort of quantity that Gore was looking for. This is a huge treasure. You know, these guys have been dumping this stuff here for years. We have the main treasure chest that we built specifically. And then we have the 882 pieces of Aztec gold, which are a different gold. And there was like, I would say, in the neighborhood of a couple of hundred thousand gold coins that we put in there. We probably had. I can't even think of how many cubic feet of rock that we actually painted to look like gold nuggets, as well as probably hundreds of yards of pearls and a mass of just sort of odd objects, things that would just be looted by the pirates. It just kept building and kept building, and, and you know, at that point you're going, oh, is it, is it too far, is it far enough? You know, because Gore is very specific on his look. His words were, the pirates aren't art collectors, they were just after the money. So I just went and just scoured all the prop houses and made huge deals with them to say we want this, you know, this much stuff. That's great. Yeah, nice. Excellent. Right, that's wig, isn't it? It's really tight. Hello. Look at these beautiful hands. 
I didn't want these pirates to be, you know, hooks for hands, eye patches, and trick or treat belts, and you know, striped shirts, and all of that, because you know, basically, they were rotting human beings. There was very little time to live, and you had, you know, scurvy, and the ships leaked, and there were rats everywhere, and there's a kind of really fun, disgusting quality um, and texture to that. Arr! These pirates are cursed, and that was the little little edge that it gave for me to say this is something really special. <laughs> I think the presumption we've made is that they are from a floating 50-year environment. You know, theirs is a much more kind of organic look. Penny just went for it. She rented a cement mixer, put all the clothes in there, loaded it with bricks, and just ran it. I was allowed to bring over Steve Gell, who's a master distresser and dyer and he worked on all the principal's clothes. And it's, it's an art form. So they arrive brand spanking new perfect and a week in his hands and they are what you see. Hey, it's clean. It's not supposed to be clean. This was a very complicated exercise in that I knew I had to have masses of backups. So I manufactured 900 pieces and then they sent me in the bodies. You look absolutely lovely. Okay, next victim. It's a bit of a madhouse when we fit, and, you know, much swapping. Oh, I've got this jacket, it'll be better on him. Um, and they just kind of came together, but th the other thing that was really a big contribution is that I had makeup and hair in the fittings. So they got wigged up, they got made dirty, so by the time I was given them, they already looked pretty good. Off you go. I remember the first day I came in for fittings and stuff. And I saw a picture of Johnny with all his bandana and his dreadlocks, and I'm like, oh, Christ, I, hit, I look like an, an ice cream. And these guys just look so cool. We've had some really big days where we've had, you know, between 30 and 40 hairdressers in, and um, two to 300 background working, mixtures of townsfolk and upper-class citizens, and it's an enormous circus. It's a, just kind of like an assembly line. Whatever chair is open, you either go to makeup or you go to hair. We've had upwards of 50 makeup artists at times on the show. Now this one will go, I almost have a dot to dot. See those dots right yeah. on the curve? It's a certain technique that we're using to create the look on these pirates. I guess in layman's terms, it's kind of a layering of color and stippling. It's not like smudged on with a sponge. It's actually stippled on with a brush. So what it does is it really gets into the creases and the crevices, and it makes them look really grimy and really cruddy. A lot of it is like rubber mask greases and inks and all kinds of concoctions that we've come up with. And we found that pretty much dish soap takes off just about anything we put on. It's really all about the teeth, ultimately. The false teeth that are made are actually vacuformed, so they're very comfortable for the actors to wear, and it doesn't inhibit their speech. Prepare to board! And it's just colored, so we never have to worry about touching up and making rotten teeth. We have several different contact lenses made from Mackenzie. Um, one of them is soft that he'll wear all the time. The hard lens really bulges out his eyes, so he actually looks like his eye is protruding a little bit. But the idea is he has a wooden eye, and of course we have a lens technician with us all the time. Lee also wears contact lenses that are really, really yellow. He just looks so evil with these yellow eyes glazing. And the opera's one of those next. Jeffrey wears contact lenses as well. They're not quite as strong. It takes the brightness out of the eye which gives him a real kind of sickly look. And Johnny actually has lenses that he wears too, but nobody would know it because I had contact lenses made for him that were actually sunglasses. And he wears those here when he's out shooting in the sun so he's not squinting all the time. I'm gonna teach you the meaning of pain. Jacoby's kind of an interesting guy because his beard is always on fire. We uh, built a big beard for him, and within that beard, we added these dreads that have wire in them with little copper sockets at the end. And we insert these uh, incense wedges, and we fire those incense wedges up, and then he smokes the whole time. And it's, it's kind of a big ordeal because every take, we have to replace the incense and relight them. He's been burned a couple of times, and when he's doing action stuff, when his beard flips around, he might, you know, burn somebody or, it might like part start part of his beard on fire or you know singe you know you kind of always smell burning hair around this guy <laughs>